Welcome. This is James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. And this is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, and you're tuned into the New World Next Week at NewWorldNextWeek.com, where you can find this audio and video of this uh, this series in high and low quality and show notes and everything else that you need all in one spot. And I would like to uh, just draw everyone's attention to our spiffy new intro, which was generously donated by Mike Krentz at MikeKrentz.tumblr.com. So everyone should go there and check out his other work. And thank you very much for that donation, because obviously I don't think uh, myself and I don't think James either can put together something quite that nice. So it's good to have a, a good proper intro. And on that note, we have a lot of info to get to as usual. So James, what have we got up for story number one? Let's get right to it from our good friend Michael Vale at StratRisks.com via The Verge. This algorithm can predict a revolution. For students of international conflict, 2013 provided plenty to examine. There was civil war in Syria, ethnic violence in China, and riots to the point of revolution in the Ukraine. For those working at Duke University's Ward Lab, all specialists in predicting conflict, the year 2013 looked like a betting sheet full of predictions that worked out and others that didn't pan out. According to Ward Lab's staff, the purpose of this conflict forecast project isn't to make predictions, but to test theories. If a certain theory of geopolitics can predict an uprising in the Ukraine, then maybe that theory is onto something. And even if these specialists could predict every conflict, it would only be half the battle. It's a success only if it doesn't come at the cost of predicting a lot of incidents that don't occur, says Michael D. Ward, the lab's founder and chief investigator, who also runs the blog Predictive Heuristics. And he also says it suggests that we might be on the right track. Now, fascinating backstory. I'm just giving you the, the bullet points of this article, and I implore you, as always, to follow the show notes and read these articles for yourself. There's a lot of interesting information in this article, but we'll note the story of automated conflict prediction starts in the 1990s when DARPA wanted to try out software-based approaches to, the, to anticipating which governments might collapse in the near future. Of course, the CIA was already on the case with section chiefs from every region filing regular forecasts, but DARPA wanted to see if computerized approach could do better, and then they all thought about it and didn't share information. And again, there's, there's a much greater story in this article. This was dubbed ICEWS, I-C-E-W-S, the Integrated Conflict Early Warning System, and it succeeded almost immediately, clearing 80% with algorithms built on simple regression analysis. So Ward Lab is releasing a new sheet of predictions every six months and tweaking its algorithms with every development. It's a mirror, James, this is the fascinating part, of the same open versus closed debate in software. Only now, instead of fighting over source code and security audits, it's a fight over who can see the future the best. James. Yes, uh, it is a fascinating backstory. So I hope people will read through that article right down to the bottom where they do talk about that DARPA history because that is important. And they also note that the ISUs, the in Integrated Conflict Early Warning System, was reclassified and went back down into the bowels of the Pentagon where it is presumably still being tinkered with and tweaked and worked on. But uh, we don't know anything about it anymore. Now we just know about these open iterations. And there's lots of them out there. In fact, I did a, uh, a Boiling Frogs Post eye-opener report back in 2012 on on sentient world simulation, meet your DOD clone about Purdue University's own um, iteration of this same idea. And I am somewhat skeptical about a lot of these ideas, the ideas of the virtual worlds and the predictions and recorded future and some of the different things that we've seen come along in this uh, in this regard. I think some of it is hype that's being used to generate funds and uh, grants and research uh, money and stuff like that. Um, but uh, the idea, at any rate, is there, and I think that there is, um, I, I mean, it's really only a matter of time and of tweaking the right uh, data subsets and all of this. And and this is one of the, the underlying points of the entire Big Brother surveillance grid that never really gets looked at. Um, a, a lot of people with the nothing to hide, nothing to fear, ridiculous, bogus privacy argument that's been uh, debunked a, a number of times, one of the things that they don't take into account is that, well, what if this data is being used in, uh, in this uh, DARPA system that's deep 
deep in the bowels of the Pentagon that we don't know anything about to try to feed into the big prediction uh, system so that they are taking all your data in real time to predict what is going to happen in the near future. Wouldn't that give DARPA and the, the US government and the DOD basically ultimate control over society if they can actually a reasonably accurately predict what any one of their actions is going to actually um, eventuate in the real world? So uh, again, this gets into this whole creepy scenario, but I hope people will go back and look at that eye-opener report where I talked about some of this in, in greater length. So, James, I, I, I do find this story fascinating, and I think it speaks to our name of the New World Next Week, of that, of, of looking forward to the future. So we'll include also a link to the Ward Lab conflict forecast, and you can look at their prediction sheets that they've put out. And I also will tie in, because this comes from Strat Risks, I just recently did what I hope to be the first installment of a new geopolitics series from Media Monarchy, where I talked to Michael Vale of StratRisks.com, and we talked about Sochi, TPP, and the aforementioned Ukraine. So, James, having said that, we'll move to our second set of stories this week, and this is where it's going to get pretty fast and furious. All these stories are coming from my own FoodWorldOrder.com, and this is a, a corporate trend, James. We'll start with the first one. Kraft cheese singles to lose artificial preservatives. Kraft is removing artificial preservatives from its most popular individually wrapped cheese slices, wrapped in plastic, of course, in the latest sign that companies are tweaking their recipe as food labels can come under greater scrutiny. The change affects the company's Kraft singles in the full-fat American and white American varieties, yeah. which Kraft says accounts for the majority of the brand's sales. Sorbic acid is being replaced by... Natamicin, which Kraft says is a natural mold inhibitor. But that's not all. Chick-fil-A to serve chicken without antibiotics. The largest chicken chain in America shocked the fast food world late Tuesday, February 11th, when it announced that the company plans to only sell chicken raised without antibiotics at all of its stores within five years. The move is yet another signal that corporate America is increasingly aware of consumers' concerns about the ingredients in and the safety of the foods they eat. The corporate trend towards cleaner foods seems to be catching fire. Those are the words of USA Today. And for the hat trick, James, Subway to remove chemical also found in yoga mats from their bread. Subway confirmed that they were removing a chemical used to make yoga mats and rubber soles on shoes from their sandwich bread saying, quote, we're already in the process of removing azote carbonamide as part of our bread improvement efforts, despite the fact that it is a USDA and FDA approved ingredient. Subway said to CBS News via email, the complete conversion to have this product out of the bread will be done soon. The fact that azote carbonamide was used as an ingredient in U.S. and Canadian Subway products was brought to light by foodbabe.com blogger Vani Hari, one of my partner Cassie Cohn's favorite sources for important food news. So, James, I think the takeaway, as they say, the corporate trend towards cleaner food seems to be catching fire. And while we're on that trend, perhaps we should take something from the other end of the spectrum. Um, people might have seen McDonald's Canada just had a viral video on YouTube recently where they showed and, and debunked the pink goop myth about their chicken McNuggets. This is how they're really made, and they show step by step how they're made and everything. And and uh, although I suppose the uh, goop that they uh, actually make these McNuggets from aren't quite as pink as the images that we've all seen online of, uh, of the pink goop, uh, it still looks like goop to me, so I really don't see... <laughs> how that debunked anything it still looks like just crap that they've they've put together from gizzards and the like which is actually what it is so so i don't know what they're exactly proving with that video but still um it is at the very least i think part of the same trend that all of these stories are part of which is opening the doors and trying to get rid of the crap and trying to show people hey look we're clean we're we're healthy we don't have strange chemicals in our food honest uh, oh that yoga mat stuff we'll take that out you know <laughs> no big deal um so uh, again it does seem like a very small victory indeed to win the taking out of yoga mat chemicals from Subway Bread, but it is part of this bigger picture that we're pointing to and that we've been pointing to for a while. And we noted, for example, just a few weeks back about the non-GMO Cheerios, which again, well, oats don't have uh, GMOs anyways. There's no GMO oats, but uh, but they did take out some of the, the GMO um, ingredients from the Cheerios that were in there anyway. So it is, again, baby steps, but it is at the very least a sign that there 
is an effect going on right now, and it can intensify if we intensify our efforts. Again, it's things like food babe blogs and, and things like this that are truly changing the, uh, the, the discourse around the food that we're eating. And hopefully, if we continue to press on these, we can actually get people to realize the, the crap that they are ingesting without even thinking twice about it, because they've never stopped to think about what products are going into these these uh, these fast food uh, chains and all of these, these disgusting pr uh, products that are basically chemical concoctions. So at any rate, the discourse is changing. C companies are going to have to react to it, and it may be just baby steps, but at any rate, it is happening. And this, I think, is a much more productive uh, way of looking at this than, than crying out for the FDA to come in and regulate it all or whatever, because we all know how the backdoor shenanigans happens with that. So on the whole, this is a positive story. I'm very glad that you've pointed out this trend. James, you, you mentioned the story we covered a few weeks ago about, about removing GMOs from Cheerios. We'll also include a link, and there's another one that's not coming to me, but the amazing Lee Camp of Moment of Clarity has a petition to General Mills saying, hey, that's a really good start, removing GMOs from your Cheerios. Now why don't you do it from everything? And I believe they've kind of taken notice that, again, folks like Food Babe, folks like Lee Camp, Hopefully folks like you and I and everybody out there watching this can start to make those kind of moves because really that's, that's all it takes. And I've, I've seen it. It doesn't take a whole lot of people to scare corporate entities into covering their butts and, and running and hiding and, and hopefully the best part, actually changing practices. So James, having said that, we'll move to our third and final set of stories this week. That, again, is a little bit of updates on stories we've covered recently and, and just over the last month and a half here on New World Next Week. The pain never seems to stop for my home state of West Virginia. And again, posted to foodworldorder.com. Patriot coal prep plant spills slurry into West Virginia Creek. State officials in West Virginia were trying Tuesday, February 11th to contain a coal slurry spill into a creek in the same general area where a toxic chemical spill last month tainted drinking water for hundreds of thousands of people in and around the state capital of Charleston. That earlier spill, James, was caused by Freedom Industries, and this time it's caused by Patriot Coal, just another great way of these sort of phony, euphemistic names. Freedom Industries, you know, I guess is actually somewhat a West Virginia company. Patriot Coal, on the other hand, is based in St. Louis, Missouri. So our other update, James, do you, do you want to take that? Do you want me to blast through all the updates? And you'll, Let's you'll just take. blast through. Okay. <laughs> Email shows effort to shield Osama bin Laden death photos. This from the Associated Press. A newly released email shows that 11 days after the alleged killing of terror leader Osama bin Laden in 2011, the U.S. military stop, top special operations officer ordered subordinates to destroy any photographs of the al-Qaeda founder's corpse or turn them over to the CIA, which you could argue is essentially the same thing. The email was obtained under a freedom of information request by the conservative legal group Judicial Watch. Update to a story we covered just recently now in the hands of the NYPD. NYPD ogles Google Glass specs. This from CNN. The New York Police Department has procured two pair of Google Glass specs, the experimental head-mounted computers, to determine possible applications to police work. The department said in a statement, quote, as part of an ongoing interest in the advancements in the field of technology, the NYPD regularly conducts blah, 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 blah. So, yes, the NYPD wanted... It's only second to the LAPD as far as corrupt police organizations in America will now have super space age minority report glasses. Our fourth and final update, James, I actually maybe fudge this a little bit. We actually covered the story about India going to Mars. However, different kind of update, China's Jade Rabbit lunar rover declared dead. It landed on the moon and has essentially died and will probably stay there forever, James. Well, uh, uh, there's been a few of those and uh, and there have been speculation about some of the ones that have died and lost contact, whether they really did die and lose contact. But that's <laughs> a speculation for a completely different day. Um, uh, on the OBL note, uh, well, there is the completion of the life and death cycle of that particular character on the geopolitical stage and all done and dusted and we will never see any proof whatsoever that he was 
killed back when they said he was. So there it is. And on the note of the other story, which is escaping me at the moment, <laughs> which was the third one in that update well, you series? Got, you got the NYPD? or Yes, West yes, Virginia. Google Glass. That's right. Um, on that very note, I'm actually just writing the subscriber newsletter for this weekend, and it, that includes a story about a really bizarre and uh, ridiculous patent that Google filed last year regarding some technology that they were are probably going to try to incorporate into Google Glass at some point. So I hope people will uh, subscribe. Uh, I, I'm writing about the uh, the five signs that Google is Big Brother. So uh, and, and I could probably write about 500 signs, but you got to limit it to some point. Um, so again, thank you so much for putting those updates together. Uh, so much going on. We can only handle a tiny bit of it, but we do appreciate all the suggestions that come in through Twitter once again hashtag new world next week please keep those coming in and uh, follow the, f the hashtag so that you can see what other people are submitting and uh, again i hope we can create a community of users around that i i think we're already doing it james i i think we're, we're doing it every every week here and and again it's it's always my pleasure to be here with you and again i, I hope to see you next week